Divide and Conquer, published at the Outpost of Freedom on August 16th, 2009. In war, in battlefield combat, one of the most important strategies, especially if the enemy has superior numbers, is to divide and conquer. Very briefly, it can be explained that if you have a force of 3,000 and the enemy has a force of 4,000, you will probably be defeated in combat. However, if you can cause him to divide his forces into two groups, each having about 2,000 men, you have gone from 25% less men against his entire force to a 50% advantage over one of the divided forces. Once the first unit is defeated, the second unit can be attacked with much greater odds than if an attack was made on the entire force at the outset. The same is true of the psychological warfare America is embroiled in today and the political warfare that has begun to divide the country and our own patriot community. Here are just some of the singular objectives that are commonly pursued today. The Restoring of Constitutional Government Objective 1. Militia. Civilian Defense. Militia have been actively forming and then disbanding for the past 15 years. They generally participate in some combat training, establish a chain of command, and then get bored with their actions. There are some, however, who have retained their character. They, the ones that have stood the test of time, have also acknowledged that the militia is subordinate to the civil authority. At this point in our history, that civil authority is the governor of the state in which the militia is formed. Similarly, the colonial militia were subordinate to the royal governor and to their local committee of safety if they had one. The necessity was different then. Indians were a major concern. The committees would also establish night watchmen if the community might be subject to Indian attacks. Much of the activity of the militia was totally without knowledge of the governor, and the right to bear arms, though unwritten, was without question. The problem is that the rebel U.S. government has done everything that they could to delegitimize the militia. Most states have followed suit, even to the point of trying to redefine militia as the National Guard. Most states, however, retain laws which make all able-bodied males between the ages of 15 and 45, which may vary from state to state, members of the militia and require no registration. Objective 2. Committee of Safety there is an effort afoot that is attempting to build committees of safety from the top down, much like the Continental Congress. They claim that all of the committees were composed of existing legislators. They have, however, put the cart before the horse. Their page refers to a book by Agnes Hunt about the provincial committees of safety. These colony-level committees came long after the original committees that called for and conducted the Continental Congresses. The Provincial Committees of Safety, for the most part, came after the Declaration of Independence. The Foundation for Organization, Leadership, and Equipping of the Militia came first from the local Committees of Safety. Relief for the people in Boston during the embargo was provided by the local Committees of Safety. They were, without a doubt, the foundation of the American Revolution. They were not supporters of candidates, nor did they support issues. They were a single-focus group that was intent on providing guidance to the community for its own defense and well-being. The problem is that through the educational process and the qualifying of textbooks, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare has managed to regulate nearly to oblivion the role played by the Committees of Safety in the forming of this country. They have attempted to destroy any understanding of true grassroots activism by so doing. The problem is, we do not have any Committees of Safety upon which we can depend for lawful guidance of our activities, 
should the need arise. In reviewing these issues and realizing what the outcome of each will provide as a result, we can see that we are facing a myriad of tasks, none or few of which will result in more than a very singular solution to a very singular problem. If, after years of effort, a battle which has been waged is won, leaving no residual to encumber us into a continuation of that battle, we can then choose another battle to pursue. However, who is to believe that if a battle is won finally and decidedly, that another objective will not appear to take its place? The division of our forces is inherent in the struggle as we are pursuing it, each, due to his personal ideology, has chosen one or another of the objectives and is willing to give 100%, not realizing the futility of even success in that battle once the battle is completed. Is there an alternative course that can achieve all of the objectives? If we were in a battlefield where an effort has been made to divide the forces, giving advantage to the enemy, we would, if our objective was to win and we had superior forces, refuse to divide our force. The enemy would have anticipated being successful in creating the division, as they most certainly believe to be the case, and would not anticipate an all-out attack on their main base, leaving them divided simply by believing that we were divided. In this psychological or political war that we are engaged in, what strategy would overcome the division that has given such an advantage to the enemy? Could it be to concentrate our forces on a single issue? Most assuredly, it would be unsuccessful, since even though that battle may be won, it would only lead us to the next battle, and eventually defeat. If we take to heart these two items, that is, local committees of safety and their militia units, we can begin forming a substitute government, as did the Founding Fathers, which, once installed as the true government of the United States, we can dispense with the problems, one after another. Would we rather pay lip service to George Washington, or would we rather do that which is necessary to achieve the removal of a despotic government? He was willing to do what was necessary to expel those who resisted allowing freedom and liberty to prevail in the land. He supported those peaceful efforts when there was hope for them to succeed. When that hope was gone, he chose the only course that remained. When peaceful methods had convinced the Founding Fathers that they would be of no avail, the efforts were stepped up to force the hand of the despotic government. Surrender was not in their vocabulary. The desire of the despots to regain control was the force that was necessary to compel the colonists to risk all when all else had failed. We have tried petitions. We have tried demonstration. We have been ignored by those in power for every effort we have exerted. Perhaps now is the time to extend our efforts into physical effort. Create displeasure and comfort for those in power and those who support them. In addition, we must be sincere and methodical, for if we fail in this effort, there remain but two choices, victory by force of arms or defeat by failure to be willing to fully commit to the cause.